Okay, for our topic for our final video, we are going to walk through a proof of equivalence between lambda calculus and Turing machines. And I'm Olivia, and I'm here with Usman and Justin. So first, we're just going to start out by giving a baseline of how we're defining Turing machine and lambda calculus before we go into our proof of equivalence. So as we've defined it in our class, our Turing machine is a five tuple, which has a set with finite states, a finite input alphabet, a finite tape alphabet, and a set of transition functions. And we have accept and reject states specifically. So for lambda calculus was actually defined by Church, and this was his attempt to have another definition of computation or formal system to represent math mathematical logic. And we're going to look at these first three bullet points to understand how lambda calculus works before we show our simulation. So at the most basic level, we have a variable x, which represents a parameter or a logical value. And this second line, is a lambda, so this whole thing is actually a lambda expression where we have some parameter x, which is bounded by lambda, hence where lambda calculus comes from, which has, <clears throat> which can be applied to this m function, which is also a lambda term itself. And again, x is bound by lambda. And then the third one is our key application where we can apply the function m, which itself again is a lambda expression to the argument n, and both of these are lambda terms. And so in this table below is the fundamentals of lambda calculus, and the two notable ones that we'll walk through that are key for our simulation is successor, successor and addition, and really successor is just the special case of addition where um, m equals one. So here we're trying to add m and n, and if you go to end of the table where the lambda expressions are, we have some function n that's simulated on f a certain, f is simulated on x a certain number of n times. And then we do this m times to represent adding the second number to the first. And this maps to our natural numbers if you look for successor by having, if you start n at zero and adding one each time. And in that case, n would just be one. So uh, to outline what we're going to do in our proof, we're trying to prove that lambda calculus is equivalent to Turing machines and what it can compute. And so to do this, we have to do two things. First, prove lambda calculus is uh, a subset of Turing machines. So prove that Turing machines are more powerful than lambda calculus. And we actually get this for free with the church Turing thesis because uh, that thesis says that Turing machines are like the most powerful computing device. So it, it's more powerful than lambda calculus. And then the other thing you have to prove is that Turing machines are a subset of lambda calculus. So proving like lambda calculus is more powerful than a Turing machine. And one way you can do this is just simulating a Turing machine and showing how to do that in lambda calculus expressions. And uh, there's a couple of things that go into simulating a Turing machine because it can do uh, like three things. It can read and write to its tape. Uh, it can like loop forever. Uh, it can move left and right. And there's also, it has to have logic uh, that decides when to move and read and write. Um, so this is the church chain thesis. So this proves the first part of our proof. Um, in essence, the church chain thesis says that uh, the language uh, that any machine can decide is a subset of the languages that a Turing machine can decide. So a Turing machine is a more powerful decider than any uh, other machine. And so we get uh, this for free with the church chain thesis. And now here is an overview of all the Lambda expressions we use uh, to simulate our Turing machine. And we're going to go uh, into one section at a time. And uh, to do this, we used um, some of Church's definitions for Booleans, uh, which we're going to go into, and then natural numbers, and also his definition for uh, linked lists. So we rely on Church's definition of uh, the church numerals um, to be the basis of our uh, definition of uh, Turing machines, essentially. So the natural numbers are our state encodings, and that allows us to 
um, index our tape and be able to move left and right. Um, so if you look at our natural numbers, and Olivia touched on it a little bit earlier with the successor function, um, but essentially zero um, is just a variable x, one is f applied to x, two is f applied to f of x, and three is applied is f applied to f of f of x, and so on and so forth, um, which can be simplified uh, by the successor function. Um, and this, in essence, allows us to be to move right on our tape. Um, and then the opposite way of moving left uh, is given by our predecessor function. Um, so we'll touch on it a little bit later, but we uh, liken this to a linked list, right? And our predecessor function essentially iterates to the ith node and then takes a look at what pi minus one was and returns that. Uh, something important to note is that um, if we're at the zero uh, node, if we call the predecessor function on that node, uh, it will return zero again. So we have a bound uh, on the leftmost node. So the second key part also is coming from Perch's definition that he gave for Boolean expressions. And we need to use this at a high level in our simulation as the underlying logic for transitions. So that could be one of two things. It could be checking to see what state we're at. So we're going to need some logical expression, which includes you know, an if and an else or an and, and then by default, true and false um, to determine what state we're at, or also checking to see what character we're reading and writing to the tape. So we'll walk through a couple of these Boolean expressions and why they work. So for true, we have this lambda expression, like we talked about in the beginning of definition of lambda expressions. And this one has two parameters and returns something in the form of X. And we're just defining that to be true. And then it's the same for false, except this case, it would be Y. So for and and or, they behave similarly. We'll just go through and. Um, so let's say we have input P and let's say P is false. So we evaluate the lambda expression for false, which we take in Q and false. And false, as we've defined it, would return X or return Y, which is the second thing, just false. So like short circuits, because we know if P is false, then of course, and would evaluate to false and or behaves in a similar way. And for less than or equal to, we really just need this to define equals to. And again, that would be helpful when determining what state or what character we're reading. And basically, if to, if the two parameters M and N are both less than or equal to each other, then they must be equal to each other. And for if then else, again, similar, this would just be used in logic for the different expressions that we're gonna, different functions that we're gonna go through to help us simulate moves on a Turing machine and reading and writing to the tape. Um. So another thing that we said Turing machines have to be able to do is uh, like loop infinitely. And so um, this is a little bit difficult to do, but what we use is the Y combinator, which is a fixed point combinator uh, where you pass in your function and the Y combinator essentially wraps your function and gives it a self-referenced itself. So if it wants to call itself, um, you'll see later in the code, it'll call itself with its first parameter, which we call R. So, um, and this allows us to recurse infinitely because the Y combinator always passes in a self-reference that we can use to recurse. So we can loop uh, infinitely, like we need to be able to do in case our Turing machine um, never halts. So to understand how our infinite tapes work, um, it's best understood, or we, we liken it to our understanding of linked lists. Um, so we start at the top of our code snippet with pair. Um, that is essentially the definition of our uh, node and our linked list. Um, it stores uh, essentially a tuple value of the value, um, which we uh, talked about earlier, is defined by the, the natural numbers. And then the second value in our tuple is our pointer to the next node um, in the tape. The first and second function you see um, is how we return the, the value or the pointer to the next uh, node. And those rely on the Boolean functions that Olivia talked about earlier, true and false. Um, and if we move to the bottom of the, or the, the second code snippet, 
um, the next about the next function um, is what allows us to extend our tape and giving our tape the ability to be an infinite tape um, where we just add on a new node um, with a null value um, and a pointer to null. Get and set are how we are reading and writing uh, to our tape. So essentially we start at the head of our linked list and iterate i times um, in the get function. Uh, and that's how we read the value that's stored at that ith element. And set works similarly where we iterate to that ith element and are able to update it and return uh, the updated uh, tape. Um, so for here, we have a small example of a simple Turing machine that basically just accepts the language A star. And again, our Turing machine, this is a state diagram, but in essence, if you keep reading A, we're going to write A. And then if we reach the end of our input, uh, we move right. And then that's our accept state Q1. And if we see anything else other than A, in this case, we just have the binary alphabet, but um, we would go to the reject state Q2 implicitly. And so on the right, we have our simulation for this using lambda expression. So we define accepting when we're at state Q1 over here and rejecting as state Q2. Just as in our Turing machine definition, we have those set of states um, that we know are accepting or rejecting. And then this lookup right here will is how we determine these transitions. So just for the first one, for example, if we're at Q0 and we've also defined A to be one. So if we see an A, then we want to write that A as we can see here in the pair, and then we're going to move right. And the other, if then else is simulate the other two possible move, the other two possible actions we could take. And then again, you can imagine this generalizes to any Turing machine that accepts a different language as well, um, but the diagram would become much more complicated. Yeah, so here's our like high level simulator code that actually simulates the Turing machine running. Um, you can see uh, the last line is actually the line that runs a simulator. Um, so we use the Y combinator to infinitely uh, call the iter function, and the iter function performs one transition in our uh, state machine for, of our Turing machine. Um, so iter takes in a uh, self-reference R that the Y combinator gives us, our current state Q, our current tape T, and our current tape index I. And so initially you can see at the bottom of the last line, we pass in zero for Q, so our initial state is state zero. Um, you can start at whatever initial state you want by just changing that. And then our initial tape is just a linked list with one element, which is the zero character, which is we define as blank. Uh, so just a, a, a tape with length one. And this can be extended infinitely, as Usman talked about. And then uh, the third thing is our index, and we always start at index zero in our on our tape. So we pass that in. And then um, if you go, yeah. Uh, so then iter, you can see how that works is we first check if we're in accepting state. If Q is accepting, we just immediately accept uh, based on our Turing machine definition. So we return true, which means accept, and we return our tape in case uh, this Turing machine is not just deciding something and it's also computing something. Um, otherwise, we check if it's rejecting and then we return reject and we return the tape. But if it's not an accepting or rejecting state, then we call our transition function and our transition function um, essentially gives us our next state, our next tape, and our next index. And we just recurse using R by passing in those, those uh, that next state, tape, and index uh, into iter again, uh, which performs the next iteration of our Turing machine. And so you can see transition, uh, we give it our current state, tape, and index, and it'll call this lookup function that Olivia was talking about. And um, the lookup function will give us uh, our next state and uh, the character. And so you can see in transition, what we do with that is uh, we return our next state just that we got from lookup. Uh, for our next tape, um, you can see we use the set function Guzman talked about to set uh, our current character to C, which is what lookup told us to set it to. Um, and then for our next index, uh, 
uh, we um, we use the direction that lookup gave us. And if it's right, which is true, then we call the successor function to go one right. And otherwise we use predecessor to go one left. Um, yeah. So that's the high level simulator code. Um, here's an example of a machine that loops forever um, because we need to be able to represent those machines also. So uh, this is just like a kind of reasoning for why it also works for a looping machine, like we see here, where we're just, we read whatever characters at index zero and we just go left, which stays where we are, and we just uh, update the character with the exact same character. So nothing changes, right? The current state stays at zero, the current index stays at zero, and the character stays whatever it used to be. Um, and so you can see in the generalization, um, our accepting state, our accepting function always returns false because we have no accepting states and our rejecting states is always false. Um, so then in our iter function, you can see logically if accepting or rejecting is always false, the first two ifs will not happen. So it'll always be the last thing. And so it'll just call transition with our current Q, T, and I. Um, but we said like, no matter what the character is, we always have, uh, we always transition to the same state, the same tape, and the same index. So we're just going to infinitely recurse on the same input. So we're never going to uh, stop looping. So together with the greatest minds in the computing field, uh, we've proven that lambda calculus is at least as powerful as Turing machines by showing that we can use lambda calculus to define the operations of a Turing machine. Um, and by the church, uh, Turing thesis, we get the opposite direction for free. Um, and thus, we prove that lambda calculus is equivalent to Turing machines in computational power. Thank you. And these, this PowerPoint is attached in our assignment submission for further notes and resources.